So, disclaimer, lymphatic system is, there's going to be like two or three questions. It's not overly complicated, okay? So what I want you to understand, it's a sewage, okay? It's a sewage system. And you have a drainage of the lymph in the following manner. So first of all, what is lymph? When the fluid, extracellular fluid from tissues enters the lymphatic vessels, it essentially becomes lymph. So you go lymphatic capillaries, lymphatic vessels, Clavian beans. <coughs> I omit all the steps here, like subclavian uh, <coughs> lymphatic vessels, lymphatic ducts, the lymphatic trunks. Does that make sense? <coughs> Basically, it is dumped into veins. Now, on its way, lymph encounters various lymphoid organs, okay? What are lymphoid organs? Spleen, lymph nodes, thymus, Follicular lymphoid tissue. So, look, let's address some of them. So, which lymphoid organs, lymph, will encounter on its way towards the veins? These ones, lymph nodes. Okay? So, check this out. If we draw a lymph node, which looks like a, like a beam, okay? Every lymph node has outer cortex and inner medulla. Does that make sense? Each lymph node receives lymph from several afferent vessels and it is drained by one efferent vessel. Now listen, I'm going to tell you the story here. Check it out. Let's say you have some kind of infection going on in the tissue, right? So this infection results in the production of various antigens. You know, pathogens accumulate. You following me so far? Now look what happens. These pathogens are collected in the lymph. They enter lymphatic capillaries. How do they enter lymphatic capillaries? There's a flap. Look. Pressure increases and flap opens and lymph enters the capillary. It moves through the lymphatic vessels encountering lymph nodes. You see there are multiple vessels that bring lymph into the lymph node but only one that drains it. Why? If you have a lot of stuff that pours in and only one pipe that pours out, what happens to like, can it go through quickly? Probably not, right? So the point of multiple afferent vessels and one efferent vessel is for lymph to remain stagnant. It takes time for lymph to drain from the lymph node. Is that clear? So that B cells mostly B cells in the lymph nodes, have time to interact with an antigen. Are you following me? So what essentially, this, this is the place where B cells and T cells encounter an antigen. So B cells will be mostly in the cortex, and in the medulla you're going to have both B and T cells. Am I clear? So B cells are mostly in cortex. Let me put it over there. 
in the medulla you're going to have more both B and T and a bunch of dendritic cells for antigen presentation. Does that make sense? And then they will migrate like because once they mature they can get into the limb, they can get to the vein and voila, right? And then they do. now what's the function of spleen? Spleen does provide a lot of immune responses. It stores spleen to a large extent actually stores memory cells. Uh, am I clear? Spleen stores uh, megakaryocytes to produce platelets. Okay? Spleen is essential in clearing out some of the blood pathogens. Spleen is essential for recycling blood cells. Does that make sense? So this is where red blood cells are being, old red blood cells are being destroyed. Okay? Does it make sense? Now, spleen specifically has two distinct layers, red pulp and white pulp. Let me ask you this. Which blood cells commonly found in red pulp? <laughs> red blood cells. And white blood cells more commonly found in white pulp. Right? Um, now, spleen is not considered to be an essential organ. You can remove a spleen from a person and a person will survive. It's often done in patients with lymphoma. If spleen houses those abnormal white blood cells, you need to remove this depot and just the easiest way is splenectomy. Clear? It does, in, it does impair an immune response in those people. Now, um, so for the lymph nodes, what another thing that I want you to appreciate Lymph nodes is the site where you can find reticular connective tissue, the mesh, the filter. This is what lymph nodes do. They filter. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, let me ask you this. If you have a fluid, lymph, that moves through the vessels, does it have a pump? In order to move fluid through pipes, do you need a pump? Look, these are subclavian veins. You have some lymph nodes like in the groin. Like you gotta get them there, right? It's it's you're going against the gravity. You gotta have some kind of a pump. Does it have a central pump? Like a heart. You probably didn't hear about it, rightfully so, there's no central pump. So what moves lymph? Lymph is moved by several factors. Some of them are are familiar to you. So you have familiar muscular pump, right? Remember that? Muscular pump. It has respiratory pump. Now, a couple more mechanisms, which are kind of bizarre. Uh, vessel constriction, so lymphatic vessels can constrict. Okay, and look at this. It's it's wonderful. Arterial pulsation. When lymphatic vessel is very close to an artery, what do arteries do? Especially big elastic arteries. When there is systole. Cardiac, you know, ventricular systole and blood is ejected into the system, they expand. When artery expands, it squeezes the adjacent lymphatic vessels moving lymph. They do have valves like veins. The lymphatic vessels are very much like veins. Thin walled, not particularly constrictive, stuff like that. Is that clear? Now, Let's say a few words about lymph nodes. So where do you have a lot of lymph nodes? Groin, inguinal lymph nodes, axillary lymph nodes, and cervical lymph nodes. Okay? Now, check it out. It makes perfect sense from the infectious disease standpoint. Cervical lymph nodes, which pathogens 
they will encounter. The ones that you bring through what? By breathing, right? When you have respiratory infection, they're often swollen. Okay? Auxiliary. Blood. Okay, mostly pathogens that are already in the blood. Inguinal. Sexually transmitted diseases to a large extent. Does that make sense? And why are lymph nodes swollen in the disease often? B cells recognize an antigen, start to differentiate and proliferate. You have a whole bunch of B cells accumulating here. Does that make sense? Lymph nodes swell. This is why some folks who got vaccine, Moderna, Pfizer, they reported swollen lymph node on the same side, on the ipsilateral side to vaccination. Okay? We're good so far? Now, I didn't mention one system that is very frequently bringing infections into our organism. You know, we talked about STDs, talked about blood-borne infections, we talked about respiratory infections. What did I forget? How else can you bring some crap to your body? Breathe, have sex, or eat, of course. Now, those lymph nodes are not very close to surface. They're called mesenteric lymph nodes. But I can tell you, from the research perspective, when scientists work with mice, those are the best. Because they are, there's so many of them, and they're so noticeable, much better than cervical or inguinal lymph nodes in mice. Okay, does that make sense? Another lymph node, actually, that you can like think of, they are too huge, popliteal, here, behind your knee. Okay, that makes sense? Mention this. Oh, yeah. So we got spleen, we talked about lymph nodes a lot. Thymus. The function of thymus, as you may remember from endocrine system, is the maturation of T cells, right? Here's the interesting trick I'm just going to tell you. There is a thymus blood barrier. Why? Now, look at this. T cells in thymus essentially learn to distinguish between self and non-self. Are we clear? And it was noticed that if something ends up in the thymus during the maturation, that is not self. T cells will be tolerant to it. It was shown that there is a virus, the very interesting name, uh, mouse memory tumor virus, uh, which can enter the thymus. And T cells that mature, they kind of see it around and say, huh, that's ours, that's fine. And there's no T cell response afterwards. See what I'm saying? So, thymus and blood are very strictly separated. So, T cells, they're kind of isolated. They, that's weird learning environment, so to say. Finally, follicular. There is a diffused lymphoid tissue. Don't get me wrong. Like, uh, cells scattered in, in tissue, whatever. But follicular lymphoid tissue is particularly important. So, little follicles that are spread usually near mucosal surfaces, okay? Mostly we refer to this as malt. Mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, okay? Such as Paris patches or tonsils, okay? Now, look at this. Look what happens. So, mold, like Bayer's patches, Bayer's patches are found in your digestive system, okay? And those are basically follicles that are comprised of T and B cells. They aren't lymph nodes, but they are comprised of T and B cells. They have some organization. And when you encounter a pathogen, you know, they being activated, they recognize, they mature, they release some, even some cells. In, in the mucosa. Tonsils, same story, okay? Tonsils produce B and T cells, follicular lymphoid tissue, is that clear? 
So this is why, like, when you can't, when you know, when you constantly get infected, maybe your immune system gets overactivated all the time, and it just becomes painful. Because what happens? Why does it hurt to swallow? Because your tonsils, in case of tonsillitis, they get enlarged. You see what I'm saying? In case of mono, tonsils get enlarged, it hurts to swallow. In case of strep throat, tonsils get enlarged, it hurts to, to swallow. You see what I'm saying? So know that follicular lymphoid tissue is basically sometimes called mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, tonsils, various patches. Okay? That's, trust me, that is absolutely, you don't need to know anything more than that. Questions?